Okay, so you just got back from Iceland, uh, where you saw some geysers. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about a sequence that has a lot of geysers in it. It's called the Yellowstone permutation. Why it's called a permutation will emerge in a minute. And in this one, you're actually told the first three terms, and then the rules take over. The rules are very simple. No term is repeated. Always pick the smallest legal number. The next rule says that the GCD, the greatest common divisor of the term you're putting down, of A of N, and the previous term has to be 1. In other words, the new number has to be relatively prime to the previous term. But it must have a common factor with the term 2 back. Let's do it. So, we're told it begins 1, 2, 3. Now, what can we put down for the fourth term? The rule says it has to be relatively prime to 3. Okay, so <laughs> it can't be divisible by 3, but it must have a common factor with 2. Well, how about 4? 4 is the smallest thing it could be because we have to always pick the smallest number. So we've got 1, 2, and 3. The smallest number we could hope to use is 4, and 4 works. Now, we're missing 5, but we can't put a 5 here because 5, even though it's relatively prime to 4, doesn't have a common factor with 3. So we can't put a 5. We need a multiple of 3, in fact, to have a common factor with 3. So 6 would work, except 6 and 4 have a common factor of 2. So we can't put a 6. So, 7, 8, 9. 9 works. 9 and 3 have a common factor of 3, and 9 and 4 are relatively prime, and no smaller number works. So, the fifth term is 9. Okay, now what? We have to have a common factor with 4. Uh, so, 6 is missing, but we can't use 6 because of the 9. 9 and 6 have a common factor. So, the next even number after 6 is 8, and 8 works. And then we keep going like that forever. What comes after 8? It's got to have a common factor with 9. So a multiple of 3, and it can't be 6 because of the 8. So 3, 6, 9, it can't be a 12 because they have 12 and 8 have a factor, but 15 works. Okay, and what comes next? We need an even number after the 8, and we don't have 6 yet, but we can't use 6 because 6 and 15 have a common factor. 2, 4, 6, 8, 8 we have. We can't use 10 because of the 15. Um, we can't use 12 because of the 15. 12 and 15 are both divisible by 3. So it can't be 12. Could it be 14? Yes, it could. So it's a 14, and so on. And it goes like that, and that's cool. Yeah, huh. yeah. But the interesting thing is that every so often we get a big number. Let me see if we can get to a big number. Here are the next few terms. Finally, we've got, we get the 5 that we've been waiting for. That was the smallest missing number, so I'm glad we got that. And then we can actually fill in the 6, and then we get 25, and 12, and 35, and 16, and 7 and so on. And you notice, all of a sudden here, we got a number which is three times as big as n. So it erupted upwards. And if you look at the terms between 100 and 200, you can see that every so often there's a geyser that erupts just as the 35 jumped up. And when that happens, actually, they arise because we had a prime. So this jump here is we hit the prime, 61, and then we got twice 61, and then we got 7 times 61. That was the next term. So it erupted. So that's what the sequence looks like. Now, in all of these sequences, when you have a rule that says there are no repeated terms, one of the first things you want to know is, does every number appear eventually? And this, in this particular case, it's not obvious, but it's true. And I would like to prove it, because... Can I ask you one more question first? Yeah. Is, are the geysers like Old Faithful? Do we know how regularly they're going to go off, or are they, are they scattered intermittently like the primes? Are they unpredictable? No, they're, they're predictable in the same sense that the primes are predictable. So not predictable, then? Not predictable. And yet, in a way, predictable. Okay. All right. Rather like the primes. 
popping up in the string of real numbers. Do they, does every prime number cause a geezer or just selected ones? Yes, all primes cause geezers. Okay, yes. cool. Yeah. Right. What were you yeah. going to prove for us? Well, I'm going to prove that every number appears. And it's, I, I like this proof a lot because it's slightly clever. It's not all due to me. It's a, this was a collaborative work. There was a, we ended up writing a, a six-author paper about this. It, but the, the proof is really lovely and slick. And what I like about it, it doesn't use any high-powered mathematics. It's just, you could do it in your head. You could do it with your eyes closed. Um, there's no need to in, do any integration and so on. No differentiation, no measure theory, no probability theory. It just works. So the proof that every number appears. That's why it's called a permutation, because when I've convinced you of the proof, you will know that this sequence of numbers is the same as the sequence above it. It's a sequence of integers, but rearranged. Every number appears. Okay, one. Step number one is, first of all, the sequence is infinite, because you might think after a while we run out of numbers. But in fact, there's always a candidate. We could pick some giant prime that hasn't appeared yet, call it Q, and take 15 times Q. That's definitely going to be relatively prime to the previous term, and certainly it has a common factor with the two back. So there's always a candidate. So the sequence is infinite. Now, the next thing I need is that some numbers might be missing, and some numbers will be present. And right now, we don't know. So let me define this. This is really a subtle point, but it's very, a very key step. I want to know, when does a number appear? When does 8 appear? Well, it appears as a sixth term. So let me define W for when. W of M is when M appears. W of 8 is 6, W of 15 is 7, and so on. But suppose 101 is missing, then we define W of M to be minus 1 if M is missing. And I want to define L of M to be the max, the maximum of w of 1 up to w of m. The point is that by the time we've gone out to w of m, every number that appears in the sequence has appeared. This is the maximum you have to go out to find m. You might, m might not be there, but if it is, if it is, so we take the maximum of w for all the numbers up to m. That's, L stands for last. L is the last chance. L of M is the last chance you have to see an M. Once you've gone out before, beyond L of M, you're in the outback, there are no more M's. So for N bigger than L of M, A of N is bigger than M. Somebody knows, so that's how far we have to go out there. Now we can actually do some reasoning. I claim there are infinitely many primes that divide the terms of the sequence. Proof. Suppose not. Suppose prime p on, all primes are missing. And then from then on, all the terms are products of primes less than p. So I want to look at L of p squared. Okay, I'm going to go out a long way in the sequence. Beyond that point, we know every number is at least p squared. So a of n is bigger than p squared. We don't know what it is, but we know it's pretty big. And this argument about it being pretty big is the key step. That's, that's the key step number two, that it says the sequence keeps growing. So go out beyond the last prime less than p squared and look at what we have. So we get a term, a of n, and we know it's bigger than p squared. We, we don't know what the number before it is or the number two back, but we know there was a term before it that had a common factor with it. That's by the definition of the sequence. And so that the linking term, the GCD, is a prime less than P. Because from now on, there are no other primes. So the GCD here is, say, equal to Q, say. And we know Q is less than P, because all the terms in the sequence from then on are products of primes less than P. So that means that QP is less than P squared. Q is less than P? Q times P is less than P squared. But then, because this Q is less than P, we could have used Q times P here instead of P squared. And this is a contradiction to the fact that we always take the smallest candidate. So by assuming that there was some limit to the primes that appear, we get a contradiction. Therefore, there are infinitely many primes. Okay. 
All right, Brady. Now let me move on to the next step. Now we know there are infinitely many primes in the sequence. Right. I can now prove that every prime divides some term. Let's say 17 never divides any term. Then I say 19 can't divide any term either. Because the first time you saw a term that was divisible by 19, you could have used 17 instead. 17 didn't appear. If 17 didn't, doesn't appear, you can't have a 19. Because whenever you got to a, a term that had a 19 in it, you could have used a 17 in, instead. If 17 doesn't appear, 19 doesn't appear, 23, 101, none of the primes bigger than 17 appear. So that means the only primes in it are 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and 17. But we know there are infinitely many primes in the sequence. That was step three. So we have a contradiction. Okay, so every prime divides some term. I just want to remind you, you said you could do this with your eyes closed. Yeah, I can. I can. <laughs> I can easily do it with my eyes closed. It's easier with my eyes closed, really. Okay. Um, uh. b because I can then um, correct myself without making a fuss about it. Uh. All right, five. <laughs> yes. Any prime p divides infinitely many terms. Step four said every prime divides some term. So we know that 17 appears at least once. Step five says that each prime appears infinitely many times. And the proof is actually rather tricky. But what you do is you say, suppose not, here are the terms that are divisible by p. There are only finitely many of them. That's what we're trying to prove can't happen. Suppose it's true. Pick a power of p which is bigger than all of them. I will prove that's in the sequence. Because pick a prime, we know there are infinitely many primes. Pick a prime q bigger than p times 10 to the 6. We know that q appears in the sequence. There will come a time when q will be in the sequence. Every prime is going to appear eventually. Well, when it appears, we could have used p to the million instead. So that's a contradiction. Therefore, every prime divides infinitely many terms. We have two steps to go. Every prime appears naked, i.e. a of n equals p, not multiplied by anything, for some n. We say, suppose it's not true, and find a giant. We know there are infinitely many multiples of p. So pick a huge multiple of p. So let's call it h times p. <laughs> huge multiple of p. Suppose find a of k equal to a huge multiple of p, then a of k plus 2 is going to be p. Once we've got a huge multiple of p, there's nothing to stop us taking p itself here. It's the same argument, and it's very simple. So, okay, we're ready for the last step. Every number appears in the sequence. So take Suppose k is missing, smallest missing number. Now we know k isn't a prime because we know every prime appears. So let p be a prime dividing k, a prime factor of k. And go out a long way, same argument, go out a long way until we get h times a huge multiple of p. We know we can do that by going out far enough. So what's to stop us putting a k here two steps along? The only thing could stop us if this term here had a common factor with k itself. So we're OK, we're safe, unless this also has a common factor with k. But then why couldn't we put a k another step on? Because this has a common factor with k, so the only thing that could stop us is that this term had a common factor with k. If we're going to block, once we get to a huge multiple of p, every term after it has to have a common factor with k. And if it, as soon as it stops having a common factor with k, then the next term we can put k. So we, to block k, every term after this has to have a common factor with k. But that's impossible because we know if we go out far enough, we're going to come to some primes, naked primes. There are infinitely many naked primes. So there's going to be a humongous prime sitting here, which is not, does not have a common factor with k. So because of step six, that can't happen. QED, end of proof. So every number appears. That's why it's called the Yellowstone permutation. This is a graph 
of the sequence. And I want to put in, just as a reference, and this is the line y equals x. This is not part of the sequence, it's just a marker. And I put down a dot for every term. And the dots fall on lines. And what happens is that all the primes appear very close to the line of slope one-half. But most of the numbers, the non-primes, lie close to the diagonal line. Most of the time, the nth term is about n. The primes are exceptions, and certain odd multiples of the primes are exceptions. Some numbers that are three times a prime appear on a different line. The geezers? Yes, exactly, the geezers. There are three times p, three times prime geezers. There are five times geysers. Sorry, did I say geezer? We used to... You can say geezer or geyser. People, people use both. Oh, good. All yeah. right. Yeah. Because yeah. we used to have a hot water tank when we lived in the Isle of Wight that was called a geezer. Mm. But in this country, the, the people say geyser. Yeah. So I will try to say geyser uh, as distinguished from geezer. Right. <laughs> because geezer will appear in a different video, an old geezer. Okay, so the, <laughs> the graph of this sequence. The primes are special, and they appear on a line of slope a half. Almost all the other numbers appear either on a line just above the diagonal or on a line just below the diagonal. Very close. If you want to, know, to, to be precise about it, there's a line whose equation is roughly x times 1 minus 1 over 2 log x. It's almost the diagonal y equals x, but there's a slight droopiness to it. All the even numbers appear on this line, and all the odd composite numbers, almost all, appear on a line just above it, which is y equals roughly x1 plus 1 over log, there's no 2 in it this time, rough, plus dot dot dot, roughly speaking. And then there are the geysers, and the geysers some of the numbers that are three times primes appear on this line, which is slope 3 over 2. Some of the numbers that are five times primes appear on this line, which has slope 5 over 2. The numbers seven times a prime, and the slope is 7 over 2. And then 11 over 2, and so on. They're the geysers. How big can the geysers be? Can they... They're arbitrarily high. Uh, uh, yes, they, come, uh, they become more and more rare. But you, if you go out far enough, you will see a very large geyser. This is a description of what we see when we look at the sequence. We don't actually have a proof that this is correct. But we do have a theory that explains everything. And I would just like to end up by showing you this theory. The theory is actually wonderful. If you study the sequence, you find that most of the time the numbers go even odd, even odd, even odd, and so on. They alternate in parity. The first 212 steps are a little special. But from step 213 on, we get a group of five terms. At 213, we get a disruption. Twice 101. 101, as you know, is a, is a prime. We get uh, 275, which is some random odd number. Then we get the prime itself, 101. Then we get some random even number, which is, turns out to be 198. And then we get 505, which is 5 times 101. It's 5 times this prime, and it's the, the geyser. So this is the group of five terms that disrupted the progression of even and odd. And using that, we're able to say all the even numbers appear on the line y is x times 1 minus 1 over twice log x. Look, I don't think anyone's ever going to reach Neil Sloan's level of sequence expertise. But if you want to lift your game on any area of mathematics or science, including sequences, then you really need to check out today's episode sponsor, Brilliant. Their online lessons and courses are elegantly and lovingly designed. You aren't just a spectator. There are quizzes and questions and interactive elements like this. Get smarter, get thinking, train your brain. Brilliant makes learning so much fun, you're gonna wish you started this years ago. And get 20% off Brilliant's premium subscription at brilliant.org slash number file. There it is on the screen, and I'll put a link in the video description too. Check it out now, 
your brain will thank you later.